Hello and welcome to Wellness Wednesday. I am glad you're watching this session, whether you are watching live or you are watching as a recorded. I hope to share some nutrition information with you today that you can use to help make your life more healthy in terms of food. So the topic for today has to do with um, with some questions that I am asked quite frequently having to do with anti-nutrients. And I just realized I put the wrong title on the, on the video. I'm going to have to go back and edit it out. But the topic for today is anti-nutrients. And it, that sounds like a pretty scary term. And I really don't know who coined it. But my guess is probably some celebrity nutritionist who wanted to get you all worked up about trying to eat in a perfect manner. So today I'm going to explain what anti-nutrients are and also to um, tell you whether or not you need to be worried about them. So let's start by defining the term anti-nutrients. It is um, truly, it's a real thing. Um, it is um, compounds in food that can interfere with the absorption of some nutrients. But for most people, there is no worry about these anti-nutrients. So I'm going to tell you about three of them and then tell you what you can do to minimize any concerns. But in general, you can kind of just erase out of your head that these are any worry at all. Um, so the three that I'm going to talk about are oxalates, also goitrogens, and phytates. There are some others, but these three are very common. So we'll start with oxalates. And oxalates are compounds which are found in many foods, including spinach. Now, raw spinach contains a fair amount of calcium, but your body doesn't absorb much of the calcium from the raw spinach because it's bound up with these compounds known as oxalates. Oxalates are removed or reduced to a significant, insignificant level when we cook spinach, because when we cook spinach, there's some moisture that develops, some water runs off, and going off with that liquid is most of the oxalate content. So now the calcium content remains and your body can absorb the calcium that's in there. Does that mean we should never eat raw spinach? Of course not. We eat spinach for other reasons too. It has a great iron content and some other vitamins that are important that for our health. So let's eat some raw spinach sometime because some of the spinach, some of those nutrients are lost in cooking. But let's also eat some cooked spinach because then we can get the, the calcium. So once again, variety in your diet is going to be um, very important as you look for good nutrition. The next anti-nutrient is known as goitrogens. And goitrogens are compounds that interfere with the normal function of the thyroid gland. Wow, that does sound scary because more than likely you really know that the thyroid gland is important for human health. So should be we worried about goitrogens in foods? Well, they are present in many whole foods. Uh, they are highly concentrated in soybeans and products made from soybeans. And they are highly concentrated in the cruciferous vegetable family. Now, if you're not familiar with that term, it is vegetables that belong to the cabbage family and they include kale and Brussels sprouts. Pretty much the only people who even need to give a small consideration to goitrogen in foods are those people who have an underactive thyroid. And it's quite likely if you're diagnosed with an underactive thyroid, you've also been given a medication to help make the thyroid more efficient. And that is a, a stimulating hormone. And it, um, the brand names might go by Synthoid or Levoxin, something like that. Um, and so the first thing is if you are taking this medication, you want to separate the dosage of the, of the thyroid medication from eating foods that contain goitrogens. And that's pretty easy to do. You take the medication and wait a couple of hours before you eat foods that contain the goitrogen or you, um, 
you, you know, you wait a couple of hours after you've eaten. So it, that part isn't a concern. The next thing is to vary your diet. Now, we already talked about varying the way you eat spinach, some cooked and some raw, but this goes for everything that you eat. And the more varied your diet is, the more likely it is you're going to get all the vitamins, minerals, and micronutrients you need. So just vary your diet and don't get hooked on a whole category of foods that if you eat too much could have some harmful side effects. And um, the next thing is to make sure that um, for your thyroid health, that you're getting enough iodine and selenium in your diet. Iodine is found in sea fish and sea vegetables. If you don't eat those, then you might consider using salt to season your food that has been iodized. So it's iodized salt. It is regular sea salt or table salt that has iodine added to it. And that'll make sure that you're getting a little bit of iodine when you salt your food. Don't overdo the sodium, of course. And then the third thing is that you can blanch your greens. Now, if you like fresh spinach or kale and smoothies, for example, then try blanching the vegetables and then freezing them. Or for me, I just take the shortcut and buy frozen spinach and frozen kale chopped. And um, if I, then I can throw it in those smoothies if I want to. But by blanching, it's going to reduce the amount of goitrogens, just the kind of the same way that cooking the spinach removes the amount of oxalates. And then the last anti-nutrient I'll talk about are phytates, or also known as phytic acid. And these are actually antioxidant compounds that are found in whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. So the celebrity nutritionists who worry about having a perfect diet are going to tell you, oh, you should soak your whole grains or your nuts so that you remove these phytates and they don't interfere with the absorption of nutrients in your food. Well, what is the concern that they're looking at? It is that these phytates can bind to iron, zinc, and manganese, and to a lesser extent, calcium, and limit their absorption. The good news is the, the body does a phenomenal job of adapting to changes in the amount of nutrients that are available. So if we have a low amount of iron in the diet, the body is going to increase the iron absorption. If we have a lower amount of zinc, the body is going to increase the zinc absorption. Our bodies are pretty smart, and you don't need to worry too much about limiting mineral absorption in the diet. However, there probably is a group of individuals that may need to give just a little bit of, of thinking about phytates and foods. And those are people who are 100% whole foods plant-based. Um, they might go by, by the term vegan, that they don't eat any animal products at all, which means they don't get any heme iron. Heme is the kind of iron that's found in blood, and blood obviously comes from animals. So if they're um, trying to get all of their iron from plants, then they might want to be concerned about making sure that the, that iron is fully available. One of the foods that is very high in phytates is wheat bran, whole wheat. And if, so if a, a vegan eats a high amount of wheat products, um, there might be a, a minimized absorption of iron. But really, the studies are showing us that that vegans don't have the problem with iron levels that you might think they would. So I really wouldn't worry about it too much. But um, something else to consider for, for people who are, are counting on non-heme iron is to separate the consumption of tea from meals. So have tea before or after the meals because the tea contains phytates and it could limit the absorption of iron in the meal. But really not a whole lot to be concerned about. Also, fermenting and sprouting does slash the phytates. So when we sprout um, grains, when we soak grains, when we soak nuts, it reduces the amount of phytates. And fermented products like tempeh have less phytate than non-fermented soy products like 
tofu, for example, or, or soybeans. And you get less phytate from bread that's been leavened by yeast. So if you had whole wheat bread that that went through the fermentation process with yeast leavening versus say whole wheat biscuits that was made with baking powder, those, um, the bread would have less phytates. But you do need to understand that phytates themselves have some health benefits. They are antioxidant compounds. And in the laboratory, and research with animals, not with humans, they have found that these phytates help normalize cell growth and that they actually stop the growth of cancer cells. So just because something has some negative effect doesn't mean it can't also have a positive effect. Also, research has shown that these phytates can help lower a food's glycemic load. And you may recall listening to a previous um, video or watching a previous video when I explained glycemic load as part of maintaining healthy blood sugar. So if you need to uh, remind yourself or learn about glycemic load, you can go find that video and watch it. So I hope you have um, found something interesting in this video, making it worth your time to watch. I always appreciate comments. So if you have some comments to share with me, or if you have questions, you can put them in the, um, the comment field of this YouTube video. Have a great day. Have a healthy day. Eat well. Eat well to nourish yourself and enjoy your food. See you next week.